I'm going to be talking about optimising care for women living with HIV. This is what I plan to cover. There are a lot of slides with a lot of content. You will have access to them. So some slides, I will just flag a couple of highlight points. I think more importantly is what I'm not going to cover today. Um, obviously, there's a huge breadth of issues affecting all people living with HIV, but uh, often women in particular. So I'm not going to be talking about bone disease today. I'm not covering pregnancy and breastfeeding. I think that's too big a topic in its own right. We heard a lot about mental health over the last day or so. I won't be covering that specifically. And I think some of the real barriers for women in terms of testing, engaging in care and accessing treatment are related to social issues. And again, I'm not going to have the time to cover those specific issues today, but that's not to say they're not hugely important. So just very briefly, we know that women make up more than half of all adults living with HIV globally. So these are the figures from WHO for 2017, and 52% of all adults living with HIV are women. If we look at the WHO European region and just look at recent infections, in 2016 there were over 160,000 new HIV diagnoses, the bulk in Russia. And the male to female ratio is 2.3. So for every female diagnosed, 2.3 men are diagnosed. So women do account for a smaller proportion of new infections. And actually late diagnoses are fairly similar by gender. Sorry, I thought I'd flagged that I hadn't. If you look at the second two bars in green, you can see actually the proportion of people diagnosed late, which is defined as a CD4 less than 350, is very similar in men and women. But it's over 50% for both. So unacceptably high rates of late diagnosis in men and in women. Now, this review, I would really recommend you have a look at. It's, it's a paper written by people that, whose names you'll recognise, looking at the cascade of care in terms of, of women living with HIV. And as part of this review, they did a literature search. And at the time of the review, with more than 165,000 papers that mentioned HIV, fewer than 5% of those mentioned the word female or women. So actually there is a real dearth of female-specific data published. So I think it's impossible to talk about good HIV outcomes without focusing on testing. Now, we know that globally, around one in four people living with HIV is undiagnosed. In Europe, that's actually lower. And in the EU and European economic area, that's estimated to be about 15%. It's hard to get gender breakdowns at a European level, so I apologise for presenting some UK data. But actually, in the UK, women are less likely to be undiagnosed than heterosexual men. So just 6.6% compared to just over 15%. And that's probably driven by the fact that we're very successful at antenatal HIV testing. Now, clearly, the proportion of women with undiagnosed HIV is going to vary very much according to your country or your region. And antenatal testing coverage, I think, is going to play a very important role in terms of how many undiagnosed women there are in your particular country. So, really, when it comes to planning strategies, it needs to be individualised at national or even regional level. Now, it's possible, could we argue that there are more missed opportunities for testing women? And certainly when you look at younger women, arguably they access medical services more often than men. So they're more likely to access reproductive health services, they attend for cervical and breast cancer screening, and actually you could argue then that missed diagnoses are all the more wrong, that the, the women are attending the services and not getting offered HIV testing. Also, probably certainly in the UK, where testing is most successful is in sexual health services, but by and large, lower risk women are probably less likely to attend sexual health services and may be less likely to be offered or accept an HIV test than men who have sex with men. And certainly, again, at home, a lot of our community testing initiatives have been very MSM focused, so I think we need to think more about non-MSM groups in terms of targeted testing interventions. And what can we do? I mean, we can test more, and I think across Europe we are testing more in primary care and in other medical specialist services. I think home sampling and home testing have certainly opened up opportunities for more people. But really, we just need very simple guidelines, and I think this fear about consent and needing to give specialist advice is still an important barrier, and all healthcare professionals should be able to offer an HIV test simply. So it's the role of all of us here to make sure our non-HIV specialist colleagues are equipped and confident to do that. 
Now, a group that I think is particularly important is migrant populations, and certainly there was a survey published at the end of last year, and it's performed across nine EU countries, over 2,000 participants, and what they found is most HIV in migrants is acquired post-migration, so it's acquired in their new country of residence. Now, overall, that was 63%. For women, it was just over half. And this clearly is a population that we need to be targeting, both in terms of HIV testing, but also HIV prevention prevention messages. And actually a paper published at the beginning of this year showed that women who had post-migration acquisition of HIV were significantly more likely to experience forced sex. And it was 15% of women, a very, very high rate. And the risk factors included staying with friends and family, the very women that you may think would be safer, actually were not, women without stable accommodation and women without a residence permit. So when we're talking about developing testing and prevention strategies, this really is a high-risk group. I can't talk about testing without talking about antenatal screening. Again, I won't go into much detail. There's an excellent report from ECDC, which was published in 2016. Most countries surveyed did have a national screening guideline. Hungary and Slovenia didn't for different reasons. Most antenatal testing is publicly funded, but the methods were different, and certainly six countries at that time still reported opt-in testing. We know from numerous research that opt-in testing yields much lower uptake than opt-out. There's also some differences in terms of the type of test offered. Now, I've summarised the coverage here. Again, I'm not going to go into any great detail, but you can see it goes from 100% coverage in some countries down to just 50% reported uptake of antenatal testing in Iceland. What the middle two columns show is that all country guidelines recommend first trimester testing, but relatively few recommend repeat testing, and those that do some of it is targeted. But that's a summary, but there is a real difference in practice across Europe. Now, one of the big barriers to arguing for routine implementation of HIV testing in any population is the cost effectiveness. Now, actually, the cost effectiveness thresholds that are often quoted in cost effectiveness studies are quite old now. So, for example, there was an Australian study in 2004 which showed that antenatal screening is cost effective if the undiagnosed prevalence is greater than 0.0043%. Now, actually, I worked it out for the UK, and our undiagnosed HIV prevalence is 0.002%. So, actually, we don't meet that threshold. However, a systematic review published this year, which has looked at much more up-to-date evidence, and clearly we know a lot more now about the individual benefits of treatment and the transmission benefits of treatment, Every single paper reviewed confirmed that universal antenatal screening is cost effective even in very low prevalence settings. And in fact, repeat testing was also cost effective in low prevalence settings. So this is the evidence we should be using. And if you're working in a region or a country where antenatal testing uptake is not as good as it should be or it's not routine, this is the evidence that we can be using to argue that it should be. So I think key messages here are we must all know what our national or regional antenatal testing policies are, and we must challenge them. And if the rates are poor, we must help challenge that. And use every opportunity to educate your colleagues about HIV testing. I think feed, feeding back about late diagnoses, but also giving praise where a timely diagnosis has been made, where somebody in primary care has diagnosed someone with a good CD4 count. Feeding back to our non-HIV specialist colleagues is essential. So moving on to treatment and outcomes. Now, there's loads of studies that show there are differences between men and women with HIV in terms of viral load, CD4, inflammation, and immune activation. But none of this has translated into clinical differences. And now we recommend offering treatment to everybody, regardless of CD4 or viral load. Really, it's not so relevant. Certainly in the START study, numerically, the benefit of early treatment was particularly marked in women. And I think it's fair to say that women are much less likely than men who have sex with men to be diagnosed with acute or very early HIV, which may limit opportunities for very early treatment. Now, in terms of ART coverage, this is WHO data from 2017, and what it shows is across the world, women are just as likely to be on ART as men, if not more likely, and the European data shows that the figures are pretty identical for men and women. 
In the UK, we see the same. So this is looking at art coverage by risk group. And you can see for heterosexual men, women, and men who have sex with men, our coverage is 96% for all three groups. And certainly, is, I don't know if Jeff Lazarus is in here. Is he outside still? But certainly, he said yesterday that 1990-90 doesn't count unless that 1990-90 applies to all individuals within an epidemic. So this is certainly reassuring for our local data. Viral suppression, certainly in the UK, is identical by risk group, so no differences there at all. Now, it was UK Chic that first showed back in 2014 that life expectancy for someone with HIV with a good CD4 and a suppressed viral load is the same as the general population. So what we see here, men on the left, women on the right, same life expectancy as the general population if viral load was undetectable with a decent CD4. And then more recently, we saw this ArtCC cohort collaboration, a number of European and North American and other cohorts. And what we see here for men and women over time, life expectancy has improved and it's better for women than for men. So women are the top line, men are the second line. So actually women with well-controlled HIV have a better life expectancy than men, which fits with general population data for life expectancy. So I think the key barriers here is gender is no barrier to good HIV care, assuming people are retained in care. And we all have a responsibility to know our local outcomes. So we're very lucky in the UK that we have access to this data breaking down by region, by gender. You can look at clinic level, everything. So it's important to know your local epidemic. And if you do have disparities, for example, based on gender, then you can do something about it. Now, antiretroviral outcomes, we, we know that women, certainly proportionally in terms of recruitment, are underrepresented in clinical trials. I've just picked a few Vive and Gilead trials as our sponsors of this meeting, looking at the proportion of women recruited to some naive and switch studies. And you can see it's uniformly 15% or less. Now, in general, there are no differences. And when you do look at the gender comparisons, firstly, of course, they're going to be underpowered. But despite that, you do not see a difference in general, but not always. And ACTG5202 was a good example. This was a very large forearm trial, essentially comparing, comparing Kyvexa with Truvada and Atazanaviratonavir with Efavirenz. And actually, in a post hoc analysis based on gender, this was the first RCT to show significant earlier virological failure in women on atazanavir compared to efavirenz. Now, since then, we've had two randomized controlled trials showing that Truvada, atazanavir, ritonavir is inferior in women-only studies. WAVE showed us that Stribuild was superior to Truvada, atazanavir, ritonavir, and ARIA showed the same for Triumec. However, both these large women-only RCTs were presented at international conferences as posters. And when you look at the Comparative studies that get oral presentations, I think that's a real travesty. Both of these studies, I think, should have had oral presentations. So what can we do? I mean, how can you improve recruitment to trials? I think one of the first things is, of course, the inclusion criteria. And I personally think some of the inclusion criteria related to contraception are really quite prohibitive. You've got to be on, I mean, it's, it's complicated. And I think we need to be a little bit more realistic, perhaps, about those inclusions. I think flexible appointments, certainly where I work, we offer some weekend appointments, we offer evening appointments, we offer early morning appointments, but not within our trials team, because it's more complicated in terms of pharmacists that need to be on site, et cetera, et cetera, and the types of tests sent. Our trials appointments are much more Monday to Friday, nine till three, and that can be quite prohibitive for women with childcare or other responsibilities. I think we need to empower people to ask about trials. Again, purely anecdotally, it's my men who have sex with men who come to clinic who I find are more likely to ask about what the latest trials are. And it's making sure people have access to the information and feel empowered to ask about trials. And here, I think peer support and, and mentorship from other people living with HIV can be really helpful. But I think we also have to be realistic about how far can randomized controlled trials address concerns about treating women with HIV. Important outcomes may be rare, and the teratogenicity associated with antiretrovirals, we've all heard about the dolutegravir data this year, that's never going to be picked up in an RCT. Issues related to stigma and social exclusion and the benefits, the relative benefits for women compared to men for those outcomes beyond viral suppression, quality of life, inflammation, etc. Again, they may not be addressed in our standard randomised controlled trial designs. Moving on to contraception. 
Now, unfortunately, there's a slide that didn't carry over the pitch, wouldn't work. But the key thing, of course, is drug interactions. The HIV Liverpool website tells you everything you need to know. I'm not going to go into any great detail. I think it's important that people are aware about accessing emergency contraception. That's something we should address with all women of childbearing potential in clinic. And it's important to understand the differences between the options and, again, potential interactions between oral emergency contraception and antiretrovirals, which are summarised here. In terms of other methods, intrauterine devices are completely safe. Many years ago, there were fears about infections, pelvic infections. There is no evidence for that at all, and they're completely safe. And the progesterone-based intrauterine system is not subject to any important drug-drug interactions. For the depot injection, no drug interactions, same dosing interval for women with HIV compared to those without. I think there's a possible concern about bone mineral density. We know the depot injection is associated with reversible bone mineral density loss. In young women, is that a particular issue if they're also living with HIV? And I think that's something we don't know enough about still. The implant is one where there is an issue. Again, I apologise, my graph didn't carry over, but based on case reports showing failures of implanon, the etanorgestrel-based contraceptive implant, there were failures and pregnancies occurring. There was a PK study performed. It compared women on no art with women on levirapine and women on efavirenz. And what it showed is efavirenz significantly reduces etanorgestrel exposure from very early in the dosing interval. So it is not recommended to give efavirenz with a contraceptive implant. But the key messages are we should be asking women about contraception, ensuring they're aware of the options and make sure they know about emergency contraception options. But we have enough antiretrovirals to choose from now that women should be able to take any sort of contraception that suits them best. Menopause. Oh, another half picture. I'm very, very lucky. I work with Dr. Shima Tarek, who many of you may have seen present before, and she really is the queen of menopause and HIV. Now, in terms of definitions, just to be clear, the average age of menopause is 50, early menopause is below 45, and premature menopause is below 40. And there are clinical implications for both early and premature menopause in terms of mood, sexual function, quality of life, but also comorbidities such as cardiovascular and bone disease and association with earlier mortality. Now, in terms of, of women with HIV and age at menopause, it's actually fairly similar on average, but you do see more women experiencing early and premature menopause if they're living with HIV compared to their HIV-negative counterparts. In terms of menopause and antiretrovirals, it has no impact. Where we're able to look at response to antiretrovirals by menopause status in women, there is no difference. And there's actually some PK data showing that menopause doesn't affect exposure to tenofovir or raltegravir. Now, in terms of looking at age at menopause, there are a lot of confounders. So we know historically many, many studies that have shown associations or apparent associations between HIV and particular outcomes. Those associations disappear or are attenuated if you make the appropriate adjustments. And the same is probably true for menopause. So yes, there are studies showing earlier menopause, but when we look at the factors associated with early menopause, smoking, depression, low BMI, and injection, drug use, they are all more common in women with HIV. Factors associated with later menopause, higher socioeconomic status and employment may be less common in women living with HIV. So I think a lot of this is explained by additional confounders. One thing I think to highlight is certainly I think in most countries menopause is managed by primary care and family physicians and this is a survey that was presented last year. It's a UK based questionnaire survey of primary care practitioners to highlight, these were primary care pa practitioners attending sexual and reproductive health conferences. They had an interest in sexual and reproductive health. Now, despite that, when they asked these primary care physicians, how do you feel confident managing menopause? Almost all of them said yes for HIV negative women, but fewer than half said yes for HIV positive women. When actually beyond thinking about drug interactions, it should be exactly the same. And certainly in terms of where should it be managed, again, almost all felt menopause should be managed by primary care for HIV-negative women, but only just over half felt the same for HIV-positive women. So there's work to do there in terms of, again, educating and empowering our non-HIV specialist colleagues to feel confident to manage normal ageing in women living with HIV. 
Shima has led this study called the Prime Study. I encourage you to have a look at the website and some of their publications. But just a couple of headlines that menopause symptoms in women with HIV are common, but they're undertreated. So what we see here is fewer than 10% of women with hot flushes, which is one of the menopause symptoms that can be very readily alleviated with hormone replacement therapy, fewer than 10% were using HRT. And women with vaginal dryness only 3% were using recommended topical oestrogen treatment, so very undertreated. And also half of the women felt they had not received sufficient information about the menopause. Again, these are simple gaps that we can address quite easily. In terms of HRT, there are a number of forms of delivery, and some of the non-oral forms of delivery may be preferable in terms of women who are on medications that may interact. Indications I've put in our national indications, it may vary by region, but really it's women with premature menopause, which to mind you is less than 40, and women with menopause symptoms, and that should be subject to regular review and the dose titrated accordingly. Now, there's been a real pendulum related to HRT. It's fantastic, it's terrible, it saves lives, it destroys <coughs> lives. Lots of conflicting evidence. This is data from last year, and it's a summary by Shima, looking at the absolute risks. I think it's so important when talking to patients about risk is relative risks can sound very, very frightening, but explaining it in terms of absolute risk can be much more reassuring. That is summarised here. However, more recently, there's been this paper published in JAMA last year. This is a very big analysis of two major RCTs looking at combined estrogen and progestogen and estrogen-only HRT. All cause, cardiovascular and cancer mortality was exactly the same compared to placebo. So this is reassuring. Of course, for women with HIV, as I mentioned already, we have the additional issue of drug-drug interactions with antiretrovirals, so this may influence your choice of route of administration. There is very limited data, and actually most of our thoughts around drug interactions are extrapolated from PK studies looking at contraceptive hormones. Now, the hormones are often the same, but the doses are different, and we can't necessarily assume the same. We also have a lack of data for the relative benefits and risks in terms of bone, cardiovascular health and symptom control for women with HIV. And again, studies like PRIME and hopefully more research should get some of those answers for us. But the key messages here are we really should ask women about their menstrual cycles. We should ask about menopause symptoms. We did a survey of our clinic recently and we were terrible at it. Really, really poor and it's something we're trying to address. And again, much like contraception, HIV and antiretrovirals are not a barrier to HRT use or good menopause symptom control. Cardiovascular disease is the only comorbidity I'm going to touch on. Now, this is all the same for all people with HIV. We're dealing with an aging population. That increased risk is multifactorial. We don't perhaps know as much as we should about the difference between women and men and the impact of HIV on their cardiovascular health. And there may be some additional factors. So actually, there's some data showing that the hormone profile in terms of estradiol and androgen in premenopausal women with HIV differs to HIV negative women. And these are hormones that affect arterial desensibility and other cardiovascular risk factors. There are, of course, the drug-drug interactions. You know, we know that some antiretrovirals increase exposure to progestogens in oral contraceptives, and progestogens can have negative cardiovascular impact. We really don't know much about that at all. And really, there's a real lack of understanding of the impact of how hormones evolve over a woman's life course and how that interplays with things like cardiovascular risk. But the most important thing really is we should follow guidelines. And what we should be doing is assessing cardiovascular risk, even in people that we think in our heads may be at low cardiovascular risk, and acting accordingly. One thing that's reassuring, Poppy is a large UK-based study looking at various parameters of ageing. The headline here is that women with HIV were just as likely to be on lipid-lowering drugs or antihypertensives as women without. Actually, most weren't. What you see there is women eligible for antihypertensives, for lower lipid lowering drugs particularly, but also antihypertensives, most weren't on the drug, but it was the same. So it's just as bad for HIV negative and HIV positive women. And that differs from some earlier work which showed people with HIV were less likely to be treated for their cardiovascular risk factors. So this suggests certainly in the UK we have made some progress. 
Finally, I just want to touch very briefly on cervical screening. There's still a lot of debate. There's still a lot of misunderstanding. My advice is follow the guidelines. I think EAX is very clear here. All HIV-positive women should be screened from the age of 21 or within one year of their sexual debut or coatarchy. We don't do that at home, and it's something that we're trying to argue for. EACs also say a one to three yearly interval. And in terms of guiding us, actually, the CDC US guidelines are very clear here about when you can move to three yearly intervals. Three consecutive normal smears or a single normal smear if the high-risk HPV typing is negative. Very clear. And last, but certainly not least, I think a hugely important message for, again, all people living with HIV, but one in our experience in our clinic when we did a survey, women are less likely to know about is U equals U. We all know about it. We're all so familiar with it. But certainly we showed locally, despite thinking we're a fantastic clinic who communicates very well with our patients, not all of our patients, well, most of our patients, but also many of our staff still did not feel confident about U equals U. And I think it can transform people's lives. And finish there. Thank you very much for your kind attention.